Item number, SCP-006. Object class, safe. Special containment procedures. Whereas the nature of SCP-006 does not warrant any extensive containment, a certain level of secrecy is necessary regarding the object's existence and properties, for obvious reasons. The following procedures are required not for personnel safety, but to deny or hide knowledge of SCP-006's effects from the personnel who interact with it. 1. All personnel interacting with SCP-006 in any physical way are required to wear modified Class 6 BNC suits. Before personnel are allowed to perform procedures, they must be briefed with material SCP-006-B or SCP-006-C. SCP-006-A briefing is the correct one, and is restricted to only those with O5 clearance. To ensure personnel are wearing suits properly, they are to be submerged into a pool of water. Any air bubbles spotted signify a leak in the suit. 2. Procedures with SCP-006 are to be carried out under extreme surveillance. In case of contact with SCP-006, the commander in charge will announce Procedure 006-G-12, which the personnel have been briefed to believe to mean high toxicity is present and they must evacuate. 3. Any procedure in which liquid is acquired from SCP-006 must be approved by 305 level personnel. The liquid is to be transferred in a quad sealant container and under armed guard. 4. If at any time personnel come into contact with SCP-006 or liquid from SCP-006, they are to be confined and terminated after sufficient studies are done. Due to the nature of SCP-006, the most effective termination method is incineration. For full report, see file SCP-006-05. Description: SCP-006 is a very small spring located 60 kilometers west of Astrakhan. Foundation Command was aware of its existence since the 19th century, but were unable to secure it until 1991 due to political reasons. On the spot of the spring, a chemical factory has been constructed as a disguise, with the majority of laborers under Foundation and or Russian control. The liquid emitted from the spring has been chemically identified as simple mineral water in 1902, but has the unusual property of health. Ingesting the liquid produces the following properties in human beings. The ability to regenerate DNA damage by sufficient duplication, heightened excitement of cellular duplication, vastly improved abilities in the repair of damaged tissue, and a frightening increase in the effectiveness of the human immune system. Upon testing the liquid on animal subjects, hostile bacteria and viral agents were destroyed immediately. Many reptiles and birds were unaffected, while higher primates experienced the same benefits as humans. Item Number SCP-009 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures object is to be contained within a sealed storage tank of heat-resistant alloy, with dimensions not less than 2 meters by 2 meters by 2 meters. Under no circumstances should SCP-009 be exposed to temperatures in excess of 0 degrees Celsius when not undergoing testing, and no water-based solutions shall be allowed within 30 meters of the object's containment area. Object's chamber is to be fitted with temperature sensors, which must be monitored at all times, and is to be kept refrigerated by no fewer than three redundant cooling units. Any malfunction of sensors or of coolant systems is to be reported and repaired immediately. If at any time the temperature in the containment area climbs above negative 5 degrees Celsius, the chamber is to be locked down and flooded with coolant until temperatures return to safe levels, negative 30 degrees Celsius to negative 25 degrees Celsius. Containment area is to be kept in total vacuum during testing, and personnel interacting with SCP-009 must wear full environmental protection gear. Following testing, all equipment, personnel, and other materials must undergo dehydration procedures and be quarantined for no less than 12 hours. Any moisture found displaying properties of SCP-009 is to be quarantined and added to the containment area as soon as possible. 
Living organisms found to be contaminated by SCP-009 are to be terminated by chemical desiccation and extracted molecules of SCP-009 added to containment. Description SCP-009 is approximately liters of a substance which superficially resembles distilled water, H2O, except with a distinct bright red hue. This red hue is discernible in all phases, and serves as the most expedient method of identifying contaminated matter before its anomalous properties manifest. In contrast to mundane water, SCP-009 assumes a liquid phase at temperatures between negative 100 degrees Celsius and 0 degrees Celsius, and a solid state above those temperatures. At temperatures below negative 100 degrees Celsius, SCP-009 vaporizes into a gaseous phase similar to steam. Examinations of the atomic structure of SCP-009 have proved inconclusive. The substance appears to be identical to normal water molecules, with the exception of in contrast to standard laws of enthalpy. Dr. Cite a resident expert on xenospatial physics, suggests that SCP-009 may originate in a universe with alternate physical laws. The most hazardous property of SCP-009, however, is its ability to contaminate normal H2O. When in contact with any aqueous solution, SCP-009 will, through unknown mechanisms, transfer its anomalous properties to other objects and creatures. Testing has shown it capable of assimilating ice, steam, tea, fruit juice, seawater, blood, and data expunged. The time it takes for this process to occur varies depending on temperature and the exact chemical composition of affected matter, and had been observed as taking between 3 minutes and hours. Experiments on D-Class personnel have illustrated the process of conversion by the substance, which has been found to follow a consistent pattern. 1. Initial Exposure Subject is exposed to SCP-009, and it begins assimilating any moisture present on the exposed surface. Creatures in this stage do not commonly notice any unusual symptoms except for a slight warming sensation. 2. Surface Conversion Frost begins to form on the exposed area as the heat produced by the subject and SCP-009 itself raises its temperature above 0 degrees Celsius. This stage can take anywhere from 1 minute to hours, during which time subjects begin to feel crystals from the epidermis. 3. Deep Tissue Conversion Exponential increase in temperature of SCP-009 causes runaway reaction throughout subject's body resulting in actual blood loss is minimal due to ice crystals allowing subjects to remain alive and conscious for up to hours. 4. Data Expunged Testing on D-Class personnel was discontinued as of 4-23-2000 Addendum Circumstances of Retrieval Subject was found in Alaska on November 5th, 19... The Foundation became involved after reports were obtained from the native tribe, who came across the mangled bodies of a team of seal hunters, which had apparently been shipwrecked kilometers from the village. All victims were found encased in red ice. Cause of death recorded as internal bleeding, though closer examination found It is surmised that the low ambient temperatures in the area retarded the freezing process. This prolonged the time to total conversion by hours, and allowed the victims to remain conscious until data expunged. Origin of SCP-009 is currently unknown. Investigation into similar events or materials in the area is ongoing. Evidence at the scene suggests possibly involving SCP- See Exploration Log A009-1 for details. Exploration Log November 5th, 19 Situation Report Mobile Task Force Beta-7, the Has Matters, was deployed to recovery site to catalog and safely retrieve samples of SCP-009 for transport to site Agent Bryce, MTFB-7, made a visual inspection of the area and noted three bodies, all male, between the ages of and 40 years. Dr. Also on site. Surmise from the relative position of subjects that Mr. Age 32, hereafter referred to as Subject Zero, 
was the origin point of Subsequent subjects are presumed to have been exposed to SCP-009 while attempting to help Subject Zero back to the wreckage of the boat. During standard perimeter sweep, Agent Hughes located what appeared to be humanoid tracks leading northeast. After brief deliberation, a three-man team consisting of Agents Hughes, Whitmore, and Cassidy was dispatched to investigate potential security breach. Begin log, 642-43 EST. Agent Hughes, we found something, Control. It's a cave. The tracks lead inside. Control, copy Hughes. What do you see? Hughes, looks like a crack in the ice. It's maybe a meter tall. The opening's not very wide. Agent Whitmore, Captain, we got a body. Unidentified shuffling noises are heard. Control, we didn't copy Hughes. Repeat. Hughes, there's a subject here, Control. Frozen in the skip. Male. About 15. Looks like he was trying to crawl away from something. There's a spear gun here. Also frozen. It's been fired. Control. Any signs of trauma? Agent Cassidy. Without touching him, I can't be sure. But it looks like he was stabbed by something. See how he's gripping his chest here? Right where this spike is growing out. He might have been attacked. Hughes. Did you hear her, Control? Control. Affirmative. Tag the coordinates for recovery and proceed into the cave. Whitmore. We using live fire, Captain? Hughes. There might be hostiles, so yes. But keep them in single shot mode. Don't want the guns getting too hot. Cassidy. Good call. Don't want to end up like this guy. Whitmore. Unintelligible. That's for sure. Agents ready their weapons and proceed. Approximately two minutes pass. Whitmore. Unintelligible. Control. Please repeat, Hughes. We didn't copy. Hughes. It's... There's a chamber in here, Control. I'd say five or six meters in diameter. It's filled with red ice. In the middle, there's a pool. Looks about three meters wide. Depth unknown. Cassidy. The f cat. Screams are heard. Gunfire. Control. Hughes, come in. Are there hostiles? There is a brief pause. Hughes. F hell. Negative control, just... Jesus, a f polar bear. It's dead. There's dozens of bodies here. Not human. I see a few seals, a snow fox, and a... What the hell? Whitmore. The f is that? Cassidy. No, 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 no. Oh, God. Control. Hughes, do you copy? Hughes. Cassidy found a, um, a spider. A giant spider. There is a pause, during which shuffling and hard breathing are heard. Control. Is it alive? What do you mean by giant? Hughes. I mean f***ing huge, Control. At least a meter leg span. It's frozen. Wait, no. Sh I don't see anything inside. It almost looks like it's made of this stuff. Cassidy, unintelligible. Not possible. We're nowhere close to Germany. Whitmore. What? What about Germany? Cassidy. Captain. I'm pretty sure that's 3023. Control. Repeat, Captain. Hughes. Cassidy said the spider is SCP-3023, Control. There is a pause. Control. That's not possible, Hughes. Why would she think that? Cassidy, voice elevated. I'm sure, Control. I've worked with 3023. It's an instant made of Skip 9. Whitmore. Wait, what's 3023? Control. That is classified. Agent Cassidy, you are to speak no more of this. If the specimen is destroyed, there is no reason to worry about it. Please continue your search. Cassidy, mumbling. But how the f did it get here? Hughes. We copy, Control. Cassidy, sweep the perimeter. See if there's any side tunnels. Cassidy. But... Hughes. That's an order. Cassidy. Unintelligible. Hughes. Check these corpses. See if there's any humans. Whitmore. On it. Control. Agent Hughes. How deep is the pool you mentioned? Hughes. Can't see the bottom. God. I'm having SCP-354 flashbacks. This is not cool. Control. Focus, Captain. Is there anything nearby you can use to measure the depth? 
Hughes pauses. Well, the spider has a spear sticking out of it. Control, can you safely retrieve it? Hughes, the suit should protect me, right? Control, all the same, try not to touch the affected material. Hughes, all right, I've got it. Should work. Looks to be about 1.5 meters long. Control. Copy that, Hughes. Proceed with caution. There is a pause. Hughes. Well, it's definitely more than a meter deep. I could go further, but I'd have to get my hand closer to that stuff. Suit or no suit, I'd prefer not to do that. Control. Affirmative, Captain. We'll dispatch some D-Class with gear to test that out. Continue your search. Hughes. Copy that. Well, I guess I'm... Cassidy. Voice distant. Captain! Hughes. Stand by, Control. What is it, Cassidy? Cassidy. Voice distant. I think you're going to want to see this, sir. I think I know where the spider came from. Hughes. Control, I'm going deeper in the cave. Control. Affirmative. Proceed. Approximately one minute of boots crunching on ice and packed snow. Hughes. Oh, that's not good. Control. What do you see, Captain? Hughes. Uh, an aperture. About a meter in diameter. It's covered in the stuff. Cassidy! Ten seconds of silence. Hughes. Report! Control. Do you have a visual of Agent Cassidy? Hughes. No. Sh she must have gone inside. Control. Please remain calm. Describe this aperture. Hughes. I, uh... It just looks like a tunnel, but there's no ice past the mouth, red or otherwise. I can make out a dim light coming from somewhere inside. Might be Cassidy's torch. Control, is there anything else unusual? Hughes. Cassidy! Cassidy! Control, Captain Hughes, please respond. Is there anything else unusual about the tunnel? Hughes. Yeah, it's... it's wet. The walls are. And the floor. There's a puddle about a meter down. Shit. It's... The puddle is red. A few minutes of breathing and shuffling noises. Hughes. Control, did you get that? Control. Affirmative. Stand by. 30 seconds of breathing, followed by approaching footsteps. Whitmore. Yo, what's up? Where's Cassidy? Hughes. She went in there. Whitmore. Yo, Cassidy. Holla back, girl. 30 seconds of silence. Hughes. Unintelligible. Control, I'm going in there. Control. Negative Hughes, we're rerouting a team of D-Class for recovery. Your orders are to withdraw the rest of your team and await further orders. Hughes. Whitmore. Whoa, hold up, take it easy. Control. You have your orders, Hughes. I don't think I need to remind you, data expunged. 45 seconds of silence. Hughes. Copy, Control. Let's go. End log. Addendum. November 9th, 19... After initial report and retrieval of specimens, it was confirmed that the arachnoid entity found by MTFB-7 was indeed a previously unknown instance of SCP-3023. Investigation has revealed the instance originated in... as a result of data expunged. Addendum. December 6th, 19... After repeated inquiries, it should be noted that the portion of coastline upon which the initial victims were found was barren rock, approximately meters from the seashore, and was sufficiently dry and cold to prevent significant contamination of the surrounding area. Had the site been closer to the water, there is little doubt an extinction-level event would have ensued. Consideration of upgrading SCP-009 to Keter class under review. Addendum, December 16th, 2000. Supercooling of SCP-009 for the purposes of experimentation is disallowed until further notice. Personnel are advised that liquid nitrogen is only to be used on the subject in controlled amounts, and only until temperatures have reached acceptable levels. Related note. Possible application of SCP-009 in cold fusion research pending evaluation. Memo from O5 Command, January 9th, 2000. We've decided to keep this thing Euclid for now. We understand the concerns raised, but as long as you keep the power on and nobody goes near its containment area, 
there shouldn't be a problem. That's why we're keeping it in sight after all. As for the cold fusion research, we're putting a pin in that for now. Frankly, we don't have it in the budget for another snafu like sight The salvage team still hasn't found Dr. Cross-testing report 9507F23. The following experiment record was recovered via a chance occurrence of SCP-507 shifting into a universe in which the described test was carried out using SCP-107. The applicability of the reported findings to our own universe is pending review. Input: 10 milliliters of SCP-009. Result: Red snow fell in test area for 27 minutes with moderate intensity. Grass growing in test area began runaway reaction which ended with entire area being frozen within minutes. Notably, anti-enthalpathic reaction of SCP-009 did not extend past the effective radius of SCP-107 for reasons still under investigation. Non-grass plants in area turned bright red in color, greatly expanded, and mutated to display cyan-colored tentacles similar to those of species Drosera capensis. Mucilage produced by these tentacles later found to be tiny beads of SCP-009. How the plant is able to survive with SCP-009 integrated into its cell structure is currently under investigation, with preliminary hypothesis being the plant is a reflection of flora from the substance's native universe. Item Number SCP-045 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-045 is to be kept affixed to an examination platform in a hemispherical chamber measuring 5 meters in radius at Oceanographic Research Station 12, located at on the sea floor of the Pacific Ocean. The chamber is to be kept filled with gaseous neon at equilibrium pressure with the surrounding environment. The chamber is separated from habitable portions of the station by 5 meters of local seawater, and all interactions with SCP-045 are to be performed via telepresence or robotic means. The bindings that attach SCP-045 to its platform are fitted with quick-release latches, which are to be released when necessary to prevent a containment breach. Given the seismic activity associated with SCP-045, if the containment chamber is damaged or breached by seismological activity, SCP-045 should be recovered by remotely controlled drone vehicles and kept at least 10 meters from human inhabited spaces until such a time as repairs can be completed to the optimal containment chamber. Description: SCP-045 is an icosahedron composed of ice-12, a metastable form of water ice that is typically formed only within a narrow range of very high pressures and temperatures. The ice is heavily occluded with planar fractures in a regular complex pattern. SCP-045 has an average radius of 1.7 meters and density of 2.6 grams per centimeter cubed, which is approximately twice that of non-anomalous ice-12. SCP-045 remains in a stable state at temperatures ranging from 0.074 to 500 Kelvin, approximately negative 273 degrees Celsius to 227 degrees Celsius and pressures ranging from 0.4 pascals to 3 gigapascals, approximately 3.95 microatmospheres to 29,600 atmospheres. Although it is possible to melt or vaporize SCP-045 at temperatures and pressures outside of these ranges, the H2O involved is attracted to itself by unknown means and will remain within very close proximity unless forcibly separated. The water will refreeze as soon as conditions return to a position inside SCP-045's stable range, and any subportions kept separate prior to refreezing will freeze into smaller icosahedrons, identical in form and properties to the total amount of SCP-045. Based on available evidence, it is currently believed that SCP-045 is a three-dimensional projection of a hyper-icosahedron, a regular polyhedron that exists in four spatial dimensions and has 600 regular tetrahedral facets. Research is ongoing to determine how SCP-045 is able to maintain a stable lower dimensional projection and whether this can be adapted for use when interacting with other dimensionally anomalous SCP items. At unpredictable intervals ranging from two weeks to three months, SCP-045 will spontaneously rotate around multiple axes simultaneously 
for a period no longer than 73 seconds. During this period, a series of small seismic events, less than 2.5 on the Richter scale, will occur in the immediate area of SCP-045. If SCP-045 is prevented from rotating, the seismic events increase in strength logarithmically to a maximum of 5.3 on the Richter scale. Following the end of the rotation period, the radius of SCP-045's effect will temporarily double for the same amount of time that it rotated. When gaseous nitrogen or argon come within 3.7 meters of any portion of SCP-045, they are replaced by different compounds. Dinitrogen is replaced by liquid water at a conversion rate of 1 molecule dinitrogen to 1.98 molecules H2O, and argon is replaced by crystalline sodium chloride, or table salt, at a conversion rate of 1 molecule argon to 4.26 molecules sodium chloride. SCP-045 was discovered in 1972 when a Foundation submarine scouting the Pacific Abyssal Plain for suitable locations for undersea bases was diverted to investigate the epicenter of a series of unexpectedly localized and strong tremors. SCP-045 was found lodged in a crevice, which had apparently prevented it from rotating. When removed from the crevice, it was brought towards the vessel for further study, and upon coming within range of the interior atmosphere, exhibited its anomalous effects. This resulted in a catastrophic breach of internal containment protocols and the loss of 12 crew members prior to SCP-045 being released and the submarine moving out of range. Addendum Following several years of testing, it was accidentally discovered that SCP-045 also converts hydrogen gas into a random mixture of simple amino acids at a rate of 1 molecule hydrogen to 0.04 molecules amino acids. However, this conversion only occurs when the gas is diffused in saline water, such as that produced by SCP-045. Analysis of the sea floor surrounding the location where SCP-045 was discovered has revealed a large community of microfauna and microflora that is approximately three times as diverse as would be expected given the geography and location. All have biochemistry, wherein the amino acids produced by SCP-045 are statistically overabundant as compared to microbiota from similar geologic regions. Additionally, all thrive when immersed in pure salt water devoid of other organic materials. Item Number SCP-054 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures Subject is held in a watertight isolation room outfitted with specialized climate control equipment. An ornate fountain filled with water stands in the center of the enclosure. Maintenance personnel are required to wear NBC suits while inside the containment area and must spend 10 minutes in a special drying room after exiting. In the event of a breach, the surrounding area should be evacuated and the enclosure flushed with liquid nitrogen. The fountain's chemical levels and volume are to be monitored and maintained. Spring water from should be used as SCP-054 is highly sensitive to hydrological conditions. SCP-054 has developed a mistrust for human males during its confinement. Thus, assignment of female personnel is recommended. Description Out of the water, the subject most often appears as a female humanoid with a mean volume of 90 liters, comprised entirely of water. Other forms are possible, commonly geometric shapes. When it enters a body of water, it becomes indistinguishable from its surroundings. The subject must periodically return to a body of water in order to maintain its volume due to evaporation. Initially found in it was moved to Site-08 for further study. Subject was initially curious about Foundation personnel and seemed to enjoy interacting with maintenance staff and researchers and mimicking their forms. After a number of weeks, the creature apparently felt comfortable enough to remain out of the water during routine monitoring, though it retreated when attempts were made to study its composition. SCP-054 is apparently composed of normal water, with no detectable differences compared to ordinary spring water from the same source. No thermal, electromagnetic, biological, or other phenomenon has ever been detected in its body that would suggest how it animates. Water lost by SCP-054 to evaporation exhibits no special properties when condensed. Experiments with SCP-054 were halted following data expunged to researchers injured. 
After this incident, containment protocols were updated. Subject thereafter exhibited signs of mistrust and aggression around male personnel, which made up the majority of the original research staff. Subject reclassified Euclid. Partial transcripts. Audio Journal 054-A. Water loss experiment. Subject becomes withdrawn and inactive when denied access to water. Its compact shape is theorized to reduce surface area exposed to evaporation. For the first few days, it moved eagerly to greet anyone entering its enclosure and behaved excitably. Possibly indicates an understanding by the subject that we control its access to water supplies. Subject ceased this behavior yesterday, presumably in recognition that no help was forthcoming. Temperature Extremes Testing We got authorization to attempt Sub-Zero testing this morning. The subject became lethargic as the temperature fell and eventually froze completely. Spectroscopy of the ice crystal revealed no abnormalities. Ice chips were collected for study. This is in stark contrast to its behavior in the 95 degree tests, when it became aggressive and attempted to escape its enclosure. We've submitted a work order to combine the climate control equipment with the subject's standard enclosure, as it has begun to resist efforts to transport it to experimental chambers with increasingly desperate behavior. Memory and Conditioning Evaluation Subject has proven unexpectedly adept at navigating complex mazes and solving puzzles. Dr. Seskel has finally overcome the problem of motivating the subject by the application of electrical shocks and or silica desiccants. He joked that we should have it trained to fetch in no time, and after observing his methods, I think he might be right. Note: Subject to be allowed a 48-hour recuperation period. It seemed to be lagging in its progress at the end of the week's experiments. Acid Base Incorporation Experiment Last Log Entry I am starting with a 0.5 mole hydrogen chloride solution. I have no idea what will happen, but if this thing incorporates homeostatic mechanisms like I suspect, then we should get some insight into how it maintains its form. Temperature in the enclosure has been lowered to 278 Kelvin to help control 54's increasingly erratic behavior. Addendum 054B after five years with no incidents, subject rating has been downgraded to safe, on recommendation of Dr. Experiments will resume under the auspices of Biology Unit E7. Caution should still be exercised when interacting with subject. Item Number SCP-109 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures SCP-109 is currently located in Non-Critical Storage Unit 7 and requires no active monitoring. It should not be removed from the unit except to be transported to a research facility, and then only by personnel with level 3 security clearance or higher. When replacing SCP-109, personnel should ensure that it is firmly closed and that it is placed on the molded pedestal in the upright position. Description: SCP-109 is a standard-issue United States Army canteen circa 1899, made of a tin alloy and fitted with a heavy cotton cover and a black leather strap. When opened, the item is seen to be nearly full of water. A seemingly unlimited amount of water can be removed from the container without changing the water level or the item's mass, which remains a constant 3.16 kilograms. Probes of the interior of the container reported an estimated volume of 2.8 liters and a shape consistent with the outside. The water in SCP-109 is of a slightly blue-gray tint with concentrations of 20 ppm of tin and 170 ppm of other electrolytes. The water remains at a constant temperature of 19 degrees Celsius, but can be heated or cooled when moved to another container. Addendum 109-1 Upon the item's delivery to Site-19, it was given the object class of safe. As tests were conducted on the item, uncertainty surrounding test results prompted General to upgrade the object class to Euclid. Addendum 109-2 Recently, a request was filed and granted by Dr. for permission to water an okra plant growing in his office with SCP-109. Staff should be notified that said doctor uses SCP-109 for this purpose for a small time every Friday. Addendum 109-3 It has come to my attention that new Class D personnel are often dared to empty the bottle. Guards are reminded that they are to discourage such activity and inform them that SCP-109 is bottomless. Chanting chug repeatedly is considered unprofessional. Dr. Klein Additional Information 
Due to the range of tests conducted on SCP-109, this section has been provided to present test results in chronological order. Dates have been withheld for confidentiality. Test 1. Subjects imbibed water from SCP-109 reported that it was very refreshing and, despite the metal content, very tasty. Urine samples from subjects were normal. Test 2. Follow-up test to Test 1 had subjects dehydrate themselves for one full day before imbibing water from SCP-109. Test remains unfinished as subjects were unable to provide urine samples. Test 3. Subject bathed in water from SCP-109. Subject reported increased energy and a much improved complexion following the bath. Test 4. Streptococcus bacteria cultured in water from SCP-109 thrived and multiplied quickly. Water from SCP-109 administered to subjects suffering from streptococcal infection killed nearly all bacteria and produced a full recovery within 24 hours. Test 5. Blood substitute created using water from SCP-109, given in transfusion to pedestrian hit by a drunk driver. Subjects showed no malign symptoms from the transfusion and made a full recovery. Subjects' physical therapy concluded six weeks early. Test 6. Water from SCP-109 administered to various plant organisms, all of which remained very healthy and showed no malign symptoms. One proposition for a test which has been discussed for some time has been one involving a combination of SCP-109 and SCP-402. Due to the risk of losing one or both items or creating a hazardous situation, this test has never been conducted. Item Number SCP-120 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures Due to its importance to the Foundation, SCP-120 is to be kept under video surveillance and armed guard at all times. Any personnel attempting to utilize the item without authorization are to be terminated immediately. All personnel wishing to use the item are required to submit a filled copy of the application form to facility operators. Due to the precise timing and coordination required for efficient use of this object in an emergency, all personnel entering SCP-120's building are placed under temporary command of the facility heads, Captain Security Detachment L-4, and Dr. Research Team L-4. All destination locations are to be kept under surveillance and armed guard. They are valuable to the Foundation, but are non-critical but any compromised destination must be immediately reported to SCP-120 personnel. Distributed Task Force Sigma-6, Puddle Jumpers, was created with the objective of protecting and maintaining SCP-120's facility and location outposts. It consists of one command unit and one defense and maintenance unit based at the SCP-120 facility at Command Five units based at the destination locations, plus five reserve units for these and five units assigned to other SCP-120-related projects. Description: SCP-120 appears to be a small child's paddling pool, pastel pink in coloration, with an inner diameter of approximately 2.5 meters, an inner height of 0.3 meters. The pool appears to have been fabricated from common earth plastics, but has shown itself to be indestructible by any attempted means. The pool's structure and response to pressure are typical for such a pool, it will flex when pressure is applied and is soft to the touch, but has amazing tensile strength and cannot be permanently stretched or ripped. What is constrained within the pool seems to be a brightly glowing colored liquid-like substance, which seems to exist only partially in our dimension. It is unresponsive to manipulation by organic or inorganic means, but the substance ripples and shimmers systematically and regularly, suggesting it exists physically on another dimension. SCP-120's most interesting and useful property is used regularly by Foundation personnel. Human beings, when alive and carrying loads, including clothing, under 37.8 kilograms, are observed to fall through the pool and are deposited at one of 11 destinations. The item will only function in this way if certain conditions are met. The subject must be genetically human. The subject must be conscious. The subject must be carrying weights of under the specified amount and only one subject must be present on the surface. Test subjects attempting to use SCP-120 while these conditions were not met reported their feet making contact with a smooth surface underneath the liquid, but no significant effects were observed. SCP-120's main use 
is as a potential means of evacuation for command during a major emergency. It is currently stored and maintained in a fortified outbuilding of this facility. SCP-120 was first brought to the attention of Foundation authorities on 31-08-1992. Local police authorities in California were investigating reports of missing children in their jurisdiction and discovered and reported the item on 3108. Overwatch Command was automatically informed through the usual channels, and a small team of Foundation agents was dispatched to claim and transport the item to Site-19, where it remained for testing over the next two years. It was transferred to its present location at Command in 1994. Addendum Document 127 Destructive test results for SCP-120, 2412-1993, abridged version. Handsaw, 30 cm, no result. Industrial drill, steel bit, no result. Industrial drill, diamond bit, no result. Munition, 9x19mm parabellum, no result. Munition, 5.56x45mm NATO, no result. Munition, 7.62 by 39 millimeter. No result. Munition. 120 millimeter M830 heat. No result. Cutting torch. Acetylene. No result. Cutting torch. Hydrogen. No result. Cutting torch. Propane. No result. CO2 laser. Peak power. 100 kilowatts. No result. CO2 laser, peak power, 500 kilowatts. No result. Document 12010. Detailed explanation of SCP-120's capabilities and destinations. 1202-1994, abridged version. SCP-120 possesses the capability of instant translocation of human beings, possibly through one or more alternate dimensions. Subjects using the item are invariably deposited at one of eleven locations. These locations cycle in a specific and unchanging pattern. The eleven destinations and their locations were determined through testing with Class D personnel carrying radio beacons. Location 1. Pacific Ocean. SCP-120's liquid displays a blue glow while connected to this destination. Subjects attempting travel to this destination are deposited an average of two meters above the surface of the Pacific. Latitude and longitude undisclosed. A Foundation ship, SCPS Demeter, publicly the USS Nassau, a meteorological ship, is currently stationed at this location, and personnel arriving through use of SCP-120 materialize inside the ship's cargo hold. Sensitive Foundation material or personnel can be sent here in an emergency, and the ship has provisions for storage of low-threat SCP objects, should the need arise. Class D personnel used to dial SCP-120 can be confined and extracted by a helicopter, or reused, or simply terminated, and their bodies retained in storage. The original Class D and radio transmitter used to determine this location were lost at sea, and might have to be recovered in the interest of secrecy, if they were to wash up on populated shores. This configuration of SCP-120 was arbitrarily designated as number one and has no observable significance above other configurations. Destinations 2 through 11 follow in sequential order after this configuration, and return to it after a full cycle. Travel by SCP-120 to this location is not advisable during storms, due to risk of injury. Location 2. Greenland. SCP-120 displays a bright white glow while dialed to this destination. Subjects traveling to this destination materialize 1.5 meters above the surface of Greenland, latitude and longitude undisclosed. A small facility was established here, under the public pretense of oil industry expansion. This facility has similar capabilities and use to the Demeter, and is additionally equipped with an airstrip and refueling facilities. Location 3 L3 Located at the Earth-Moon Lagrange Point 3 the SCP displays a deep black color. Objects and personnel sent through the SCP to any Lagrange point, locations 3, 5, 8, 10, and 11, are effectively lost, as retrieval is impossible at our current level of technology. They may prove a possible way to remove small but threatening SCP objects, but for now, are merely an inconvenience.
as sacrifice of D personnel is required to move the SCP to its next configuration. Location 4. Himalayas. SCP-120 displays a white glow similar to when it is dialed to Location 2. Materialization occurs on a mountain in the Himalayan mountain range, latitude and longitude undisclosed. Only minor changes have been made to the destination, the digging of an 8-meter hole for disposal of D-class bodies, an overhead canopy for concealment, and supplies and testing for evacuation to this location, which should only take place in extreme circumstances. D-class personnel used for dialing are to be injected with a mixture of sedatives and neurotoxin before sending, to ensure a humane death, and decrease risk of damage to the structures at Location 4. Location 5 L5 Identical to Location 3 Location 6 Sahara SCP-120 will glow yellow. Personnel materialize at a small outpost, latitude and longitude undisclosed. The need for secrecy renders this facility unable to house any significant SCP object, but is ideal for evacuation of personnel and documents from command. Location 7 Gobi SCP-120 displays a brown glow. This destination is located in a small outpost in the Gobi Desert, latitude and longitude undisclosed, but is otherwise identical to the Location 6 outpost. Location 8 L2 identical to Location 3, although shows more potential for SCP disposal, being situated beyond the moon. Location 9 Mare Imbrium The SCP displays a subdued gray glow when dialed into this destination. This destination is on a relatively flat section of the Sea of Rains, on the lunar surface. Through vast expenditure of money and D-class personnel, a small outpost has been established there and is considered one of the Foundation's safest locations. Location 10 L4 Identical to Location 3 Location 11 L1 Identical to Location 3 Item Number SCP-151 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures SCP-151 should be kept in a locked storage compartment, covered by an opaque cloth. The keys to the compartment should be kept in the custody of the site commander when SCP-151 is not being researched. When research is being conducted, SCP-151 may be kept in a locked laboratory, provided it is always covered when not being used. Description SCP-151 is a 1 meter by 1.3 meter or 3 foot by 4 foot oil painting, apparently from the perspective of someone underwater. A subject who views the painting exhibits no initial effects. However, over a period of 24 hours, the subject's breathing becomes increasingly labored, culminating in the death of the subject. Autopsies reveal that subject's lungs have filled with seawater. Attempts to halt the drowning process by medical intervention have proven successful in prolonging the life of the subject, but have not stopped nor reversed the condition. The painting is not signed but several names are written on the back. Addendum SCP-151 was found in an antique shop in after the Foundation began investigating a series of unexplained drowning deaths. As said location is landlocked, the Foundation dispatched a team of plainclothes agents after being informed of the nature of the water in the victim's lungs and that the victims had all been discovered on dry land. The agents discovered that the names written on the back belonged to a group of artistically inclined students, all of whom disappeared during a study abroad program in Investigation into their fate is ongoing, and may provide clues as to the nature and origin of SCP-151. Item Number SCP-170 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-170 presents no danger, and as such can be contained safely in any secure storage locker. However, due to the potential misuse of the substance, as well as the limited quantity of SCP-170 available, no personnel may remove it from storage without prior approval from Dr. Description SCP-170 appears to be a standard tube of superglue, in a yellow tube 13 centimeters long. There is no manufacturer information or any other text on the outside of the container, apart from the words superglue 
printed in bold letters on the front. Whenever any amount of the substance is applied to solid material, and that solid is put in contact with any surface, both objects lose molecular cohesion in the area surrounding the contact points, allowing one to be pushed through the other. The effect lasts only moments, however. Within a third of a second of the two surfaces making contact, the ability of each to pass through the other is nullified, leaving both permanently bonded together. SCP-170 was seized in a raid on an illegal laboratory in, in 19... The unusual properties of SCP-170 were unknown, until a standard test on all seized materials was performed on it. A laboratory technician used a pipette to extract a small amount of SCP-170 for analysis. Upon attempting to dispense the substance onto a slide, the pipette immediately passed straight through the slide, which was on a mount. Further tests were run upon the pipette slide, and it was discovered that they were bonded on the molecular level. Upon hearing of this, SCP personnel were dispatched to confiscate all seized materials. Notable Tests Test 04 Test Materials One heavy-duty chain, weights of various sizes. Procedure A small amount of SCP-170 was applied to the last link of the chain, which was then bonded to the reinforced ceiling of Containment Area 17F. Weights of various sizes were then hung on the chain to determine the structural falling point of the bond. Results after approximately 9 metric tons were suspended, the chain finally snapped, but not at the bond point. It snapped at the ninth link from the bottom. All links apart from the one embedded in the ceiling were tested and showed signs of distortion and stretching. However, the bond point in the ceiling showed no sign of weakness or separation of chain and ceiling. Test 07 Test Materials Two identical cubes of 24 karat gold, as close to 100% pure as possible. Procedure Using robotic arms to ensure perfect alignment, Cube 1, the cube with SCP-170 applied, was pushed completely through Cube 2, leaving what appeared to be one gold cube equal in size to either of the original cubes. Results Upon examination of the sole remaining cube, it was found to have a density of 38.6 grams per centimeter cubed, which is precisely twice the density of gold. Even melting the sample did nothing to change this, as the resulting liquid gold also had the same density. This implies that the substances don't displace each other. Every atom is accounted for. Analysis of the atoms has proven that they are regular gold atoms, implying that they don't undergo nuclear fusion to accomplish this increase in density. The atoms are simply packed into a smaller space than the laws of physics would seem to allow. In light of this experiment, Dr. has requested permission to use SCP-170 to glue two pieces of uranium together to make a more fissile sample. Due to the obvious safety concerns this poses, this request was denied. Test 12 Test Materials 1 D-Class Personnel 1 Wooden Desk Procedure First test using live biological subjects. D-Class personnel had a small amount of SCP-170 applied to his right index finger and was instructed to poke the desk. Results Subject's finger sank into the desk up to the first knuckle. Despite obvious panic, the subject reported no pain, discomfort, or sensation below the bond point. However, his finger quickly began swelling and turned purple, as his circulatory system continued pumping blood to an area that could no longer return it. Finger was amputated, between the first and second knuckle. Test 19 Test Materials 1 Pratt & Whitney F-100 Jet Engine The Reinforced Ceiling of Containment Area 19B Procedure SCP-170 was applied to the jet engine mountings, which were quickly pushed 3.2 centimeters, or approximately 1.25 inches, into the ceiling of the chamber. After connecting an appropriate fuel supply and control system, the jet engine was fired. Results The engine was run continuously at high speed for 40 minutes, while cameras monitored the join point for any signs of stress. 
While small cracks appeared in the concrete around the join point, there were no indications of any possible structural failures or separation of the two materials, even under a force of 120,000 newtons. Item Number SCP-195 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures One case containing 17 bottles of SCP-195 exists in Foundation custody. It is kept in a number 3 secure containment locker unit in the safe class storage section of Site-1279. Access to SCP-195 requires written authorization from no fewer than two Level 4 personnel and accompaniment by a member of Site Security. Due to the untested possibility of exposure due to the inhalation of evaporated SCP-195, access requires full Level C hazmat kit, including respirator gear. It is possible that further instances of SCP-195 exist. All recovery agents are advised to make note of bottles of similar style or bearing similar labels to contain samples of SCP-195, as well as Should further instances of SCP-195 be discovered, they are to be collected by a temporary containment team in full hazmat kit, including respirators. Description SCP-195 is a medicinal whiskey sold by a pair of traveling salesmen in the pre-Civil War South. Various historical sources agree that the whiskey was targeted primarily to the slave catchers of that era and was advertised as having mind-enhancing properties. These sources agree that the salesmen were often driven out of town when the side effects of their concoction were discovered and were hanged for their devilish ways on at least two occasions. When a subject consumes any quantity of SCP-195, they will initially react in a manner consistent with the consumption of an equal quantity of gut rot whiskey or moonshine. Within a short span of time, time frame varies by subject, they begin to experience heightened awareness and increased sensory input, taste, touch, smell, etc. This effect of the whiskey was advertised by its salesman and was the reason for its target audience. With this heightened sensory capability, however, comes a general decrease in impulse control and heightened fight-or-flight response, which has, in testing, been shown to lead to markedly increased levels of violent behavior. This response is theorized to explain the brutality shown by data expunged. D-Class personnel under the effect of SCP-195 are capable of and willing to data expunged to enjoy the violence of the act. D-183578 First Degree Murder Rape Terminated Expressed a desire to rip the head off with my teeth. Further testing on the capacities of SCP-195 is deemed unnecessary. Late research assistant Renfield has been posthumously awarded a Foundation citation for performance above and beyond the requirements of duty. After the whiskey's effects wear off, the test subject will generally return to normal, with the exception of those who data expunged. Within a month, however, all subjects will experience a generalized feeling of ennui, coupled with fatigue. MRI scans at this stage show development of ulcer-like wounds in the stomach and lungs. These continue to spread indefinitely until the death of the subject. Additionally, the subject's skin and muscle structure begins to degrade, particularly around points of stress or motion. This degradation also continues indefinitely, or until the death of the subject. SCP-195 was discovered by the son of a historian in Alabama in late 2000. Mr. R's arrest and sentencing for the murder of R was an item of minor interest in local news in the area. The Foundation became interested in his case when he was admitted to a hospital, at which point the unusual degradation of his skin and organs was noted by Foundation informants in the medical community and traced back to an antebellum home where he had assisted his father in cataloging various items of historical interest. A Foundation team was dispatched to the home and located an open case containing several bottles of SCP-195. Addendum Historical sources' descriptions of the salesmen seem to agree that one man was blonde and unusually tall, while the other had dark hair and walked with a stoop. Both men had strange bright eyes and wore matching clothing. 
All personnel are reminded that their capture is level 6 priority. Item number SCP-198 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures SCP-198 is located in a secure room of site with armed guards posted outside to prevent any unauthorized access. SCP-198 is to be stored under 24-hour video surveillance in a sealed and locked case, 0.5 meters by 0.5 meters by 0.5 meters, and the key kept in a secured location accessible only to those personnel with level 3 clearance and above. Under no circumstances are any Foundation personnel to handle SCP-198. All handling of SCP-198 is to be done via remote robotic means or by D-Class test subjects only. In light of Incident 198-A and Incident 198-B, Object Class has been elevated to Euclid, and Containment Protocol 198 has been established. SCP-198's case must now be kept on a digital scale, attached to an alarm system, with redundant backups for power in its secure room. Any deviations in weight will indicate a breach and site supervisors must immediately enact Containment Protocol 198 detailed below. Description: SCP-198 has taken numerous forms since coming into Foundation possession in 19... Since acquisition, SCP-198 has been observed to have had dozens of different forms, including a styrofoam cup, a glass beer bottle, aluminum soda cans, an oversized shot glass that read 1 tequila, 2 tequila, 3 tequila, floor, a plastic water bottle with a label partially peeled off, and data expunged. These forms always appear partially filled with the expected liquid a vessel of that type would contain. Currently, SCP-198 appears as an ordinary white porcelain coffee mug, with blue vertical stripes evenly spaced around its exterior. There are no visible manufacturer markings or otherwise remarkable details about its appearance in its current form. The object has resisted all attempts at destruction or sampling for further analysis. When inactive, SCP-198 can hold the expected 240 milliliters, or 8 fluid ounces, of liquid that any standard coffee mug would hold. Anomalous behavior does not manifest until a live human being grasps SCP-198 to hold it. Approximately two to five seconds after the SCP is held, it will instantly bond itself through unknown, albeit painful means to the handler's hand or hands. Test subjects have reported the pain of bonding with SCP-198 as a searing or fiery sensation, though no heat can be detected by outside observers or instruments. The use of gloves or other barriers between the object and the hand does not prevent the bonding process so long as the subject can still grip SCP-198. Extensive testing has revealed that the bond appears to be at the molecular level and is permanent until the death of its holder. To date, no means have been found to break the bond, including cutting or severing the fingers or hand of the holder, as any wounds below the wrist of the test subject heal instantaneously. Further proposed testing of the range of healing up the handler's arm is pending approval. Once bonded, any liquid inside SCP-198 will disappear, and the container will inexplicably begin to fill from the bottom up with a fluid or a semi-solid material, stopping only once it reaches the top of the container. The liquid or semi-solid is different for each holder, but it has to date been a bodily fluid or human excretion in each test instance. Such instances have included human saliva, sweat, blood, bile, mucus, urine, feces, and data expunged, as well as combinations of two or more of these. Once SCP-198 has filled, the holder will undergo rapid dehydration and or emaciation, becoming increasingly malnourished to the point of death, which usually occurs within 24 hours if nothing is done to prevent it. Ingestion of standard foods, liquids, or IV-supplied nutrients does nothing to reverse or slow this process. Testing has revealed that the only means by which the subject can gain nourishment is by consuming the contents of SCP-198. However, the constant rate of dehydration and emaciation remains the same, forcing the test subject to consume vast quantities of the excretions almost constantly to remain alive. 
as the contents are consumed or, as is often the case, dumped out of the container. SCP-198 will continue to refill itself automatically. Test subjects have lasted as long as 70 hours by consuming the excretions before finally succumbing to exhaustion or refusing to consume any more of the contents, which invariably leads to death. Upon expiration of the handler, the bond with SCP-198 is broken and the object can once again be manipulated. In approximately 75% of test instances, SCP-198 will disappear once the bond is broken and reappear almost instantly on a nearby flat surface, seemingly with a preference for tables or shelves within the same room, and take on a new form. Approximately 90% of these reappearances of SCP-198 are within the general vicinity of the now deceased handler, but several times the object has been observed to reappear in nearby containment rooms, observation rooms, and in one case, data expunged. Due to the catastrophic nature of that incident, extreme care is to be taken when in proximity to SCP-198's containment or testing room. Foundation personnel are urged not to bring with them any beverages or containers within 100 meters of SCP-198's containment room, even when the object is not actively being researched. SCP-198 was acquired by the Foundation from an underground bunker in Germany after the bunker's accidental discovery by construction workers. Reports of strange activity and deaths among the construction company regarding this bunker brought the object to Foundation attention. Agent upon responding to the location, discovered several deceased and grossly emaciated corpses, both recent and some quite old. Unaware of the nature of their deaths, or the SCP in question, said agent sealed off the area and awaited backup. It was then that the nature of the SCP object revealed itself, as the agent mistakenly grabbed what appeared to be an unopened bottle of water from a table at the construction site. Backup arrived to find an extremely agitated agent vomiting and struggling to remove his hand from a cup full of fresh data expunged. Said agent later self-terminated during location cleanup. Incident 198-A Date Undisclosed Location Site Description At approximately 2.15 p.m., researcher John who was working in an observation room adjacent to SCP-198's containment room, reached for what he thought to be his thermos of iced tea, only to discover he was firmly bonded to what appeared to be SCP-198. Immediately, researcher notified site supervisors who, upon inspection of containment room 198, discovered that SCP-198 was indeed missing from its case. At least three months had passed since the last experiment had been conducted on SCP-198 without incident. Researcher was interviewed by site staff and was kept alive by consuming the contents of SCP-198 for 31 hours, before finally refusing to drink the contents any longer. Incident 198-B Date Undisclosed Location Site Description at approximately 8 a.m., security guard Albert stopped to get a cup of coffee from a break room, later determined to be located three floors underneath and two hallways over from SCP-198's containment room. The guard found himself bonded to SCP-198 when he attempted to grab a bottle of dairy creamer from the break room refrigerator. Once again, site supervisors were notified of a potential containment breach and discovered SCP-198's case to be empty. The guard was interviewed and chose to self-terminate rather than consume any of the contents of SCP-198. Immediately after Incident 198-B, Site Supervisors determined that the object class should be raised to Euclid, and Containment Protocol 198 was created to handle future containment breaches. Containment Protocol 198 Containment Protocol 198 is to be executed immediately by Site Supervisors, after a containment breach of SCP-198 is detected. In the event that the alarm attached to SCP-198's scale is sounded, Site is to be locked down, and all personnel are to immediately avoid any beverage containers and evacuate the facility until SCP-198 can be located and properly secured. Experiment Log 198-A Experiment Log of Dr. on SCP-198 
testing various manifestations of its anomalous properties. Notes. Testing on SCP-198 is to be done outside of its containment room, in a secure experimentation room. SCP-198 is to be placed via robotic means on a plain table in the center of the otherwise empty room. During experimentation, all Foundation personnel are to remotely observe either via surveillance camera or adjacent observation room behind a secure plexiglass window. At no time should any Foundation personnel enter the experimentation room while experiments are being conducted. Armed guards and cleanup crews will be posted outside the experimentation room and will not enter until the test subject has expired. Experiment 198-A-1 Date Undisclosed Procedure Object is observed to have the form of a small glass of water. Class D personnel instructed to enter room and touch SCP-198 with his finger, but ordered not to hold or pick up the object. Results No bonding takes place, and Class D personnel is unaffected. Experiment 198-A-2 Date Undisclosed Procedure Same Class D personnel is instructed to pick up SCP-198. Results Class D personnel screams in surprise as the bonding process takes place. Test subject immediately begins to try and pry SCP-198 from his hand. Test subject ordered to calm down and describe the contents of SCP-198. Doctor, please describe the contents of the object in your hand. Test subject. What the fuck is going on? I can't get it off. Liquid is seen spilling from SCP-198 as the test subject flails around. Doctor, yes, we are aware of the situation. Please calm down and describe the contents of the object in your hand. D-Class personnel is seen to cautiously sniff the contents of SCP-198. Test subject, is that- Oh god, that's disgusting, man. Test subject stumbles slightly and falls to one knee at this point. Doc? I don't feel so good, man. Doctor, please describe what you're feeling right now. Test subject. I... I feel weak. Tired. Thirsty, too. What's going on? Can I get some water, man? Doctor, I'm sorry. I cannot do that. But perhaps the contents in your hand. Test subject. Are you f***ing kidding me, man? No f***ing way. Doctor. Suit yourself. Approximately two hours into the experiment, the test subject is observed to curse loudly before gulping down the contents of SCP-198. Test subject periodically drinks from SCP-198 until finally succumbing to exhaustion and expiring 29 hours into the experiment. Subsequent autopsy determines the contents of the test subject's stomach to be mostly human urine. DNA profile on the urine came back inconclusive and with no known match in our database. Upon death of the test subject, SCP-198 unbonded, disappeared, and returned to the table in the form of a large, half-filled plastic pitcher of what appears to be ice and lemonade. Experiment 198-A-3 Date Undisclosed Procedure Class D personnel instructed to enter room and don surgical gloves placed on the table next to SCP-198. Once the test subject is wearing the gloves, subject is instructed to pick up SCP-198, still in lemonade pitcher form, and pour herself a glass. Results: Test subject is observed to use both hands to lift the pitcher to pour a drink. Once again, Class D personnel shouts in surprise as the bonding process takes place, despite the gloves, and appears to have both hands bonded to SCP-198. Test subject is highly agitated and clearly in pain. Test subject. Ow, 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 ow. It burned me. Doctor, it would appear that both of your hands are stuck to the container. Is that the case? Test subject. Yeah, does it look like I'm not stuck? Test subject is visibly straining to pull her hands apart from SCP-198. Doctor, can you remove your hands from the gloves? Test subject. No! They're stuck to this damn thing! Th 
Test subject pauses mid-sentence and stares at the pitcher in her hands. Seconds later, test subject is seen vomiting violently and falling to her knees. A brownish, semi-solid mass spills onto the floor from SCP-198. Doctor, can you please describe the contents of the pitcher, please? Test subject. Expletives expunged. Test subject continued vomiting for approximately 10 minutes before collapsing to the floor. Test subject became uncooperative at this point and would not respond to the researcher's requests. Security guards are instructed to enter the experimentation room and terminate test subject. Testing concluded that the substance in question was human feces. Again, the DNA profile of the substance was inconclusive and matchless in our database. Upon death of the test subject, SCP-198 unbonded and remained in its lemonade pitcher form, once again half filled with what appeared to be lemonade and ice but did not teleport back to the table's surface. Lesson complete. To continue with your orientation training, subscribe to SCP Orientation right now and make sure you don't miss any of our upcoming videos.